another edition, a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Stephen Nall, and today is April 26th, 2018. All right. I want to thank our guest, the uh, Reverend Dr. Stephen Knoll, for joining us today. It's a, going to be a special episode of Anglican Unscripted. Um, for those who are longtime viewers of Anglican TV, you've probably seen three or four interviews I've done with uh, uh, Stephen. Usually, uh, we did one at Uganda Christian University, which is the first interview we, we did with you. Uh, the latest one I can think of would be at the last GAFCON, where we sat in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, at the top of the uh, the hotel in their little bar area, and you did a wonderful interview for us to to help get people up of what was happening with GAFCON and uh, a lot of people are interested in obviously your writings and, and your interviews so I thought it's time to have you back on the program uh, first of all, first of all you, you've written a new book but before we get to that how are you doing? I'm doing uh, fine uh, thank you Kevin uh, I'm happily retired which uh, means in my lingo getting a new set of tires yes. There's <laughs> mom and dad retired, or they've never been busier. So yeah, I I, I know what re retirement really means. It's uh, you just get busier with projects that don't pay as much. Um, now you were uh, the dean out at Uganda Christian University. Um, you were a professor out there. Um, you you you're well familiar with uh, African Anglicanism and African politics, um, and have a a nice sense of global politics as well within the church. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this book you've uh, written called The Global Anglican Communion, Contending for Anglicanism 1993 to 2018. Um, because you, in there you, you outlined three different areas uh, in this book, starting with paving stones. Uh, what do Anglicans believe? Um, can you give me a little basis for what Anglicans uh, believe? Right. Well, let me just start by saying that this book is a collection of essays that I've written over 25 years. And uh, the first section <clears throat> is an, an attempt to describe the three fundamental doctrines of the church which have been contested uh, in this period of time. The first one is the doctrine of Scripture, the inspiration of, of, of Scripture as God's Word written. The second one has to do with uh, marriage and human sexuality. I don't think I need to kind of wave that in front of you to know that that's the issue. The third one has to do with the nature of the church itself, and particularly a communion of churches like the Anglican Communion. <clears throat> so I have written over different periods of time uh, essays or teachings with regard to each one of those. Now, there's been, you know, our fathers in the church... Uh, certainly wrote a lot. We have uh, kind of the rediscovery after the, the Oxford movement, and we know well what they thought. What, I have, what we seem to have trouble with is adopting um, what the forefathers and adopting what Scripture says and adopting kind of the history of the church into our modern church. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, of course, there's always a problem of what we might call application mm -hmm. or implications of scripture that's been true throughout the whole history uh, of the church it's had to take the word of god and apply it to its particular context <clears throat> the problem in modern uh, christianity has been the dominance of hermeneutics or biblical interpretation to essentially twist the scripture to say whatever the particular cause of the day is and so my first essay was actually written back in 1992 for the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church. And they had asked four seminary professors to write on the subject. And I chose the rather um, combative title of the literal sense of Scripture, which I then went on to sort of defend sure. in, in its fullest sense. And uh, I think that it is a way of, of stating, I called it reading the Bible as the Word of God. I mean, can we take God at His Word? And my answer is yes. We have to interpret, we have to apply uh, the Scripture, but ultimately we can trust that when God speaks and when that Word is recorded in Scripture, it is the very voice of God. Well, part of hermeneutics in the studies I've done is the desire to stay with the simplest reading of scripture 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, not to overcomplicate it, not to put man's eye on it, but to to understand it as it was written. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I think we've pretty much pushed that completely out in uh, modern day seminaries and uh, uh, Christianity. Well, you know, I was also years later involved in uh, uh, advising on the so-called Jerusalem de- Declaration at Gafcon. And we made a statement about the nature of Scripture, which I think reflects the view that I had written about 15 years before that. Here's what we said. Um, We believe the Holy Scriptures, the Old and New Testament, to be the Word of God written and to contain all things necessary for salvation. Um, uh, The Bible is to be translated, read, preached, taught, and obeyed in the plain and canonical sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, with uh, respectful of the church's historic and consensual reading. So that term, plain and canonical sense, is something that I was trying to get at, but also in the context of our tradition of reading the scripture, going back to the reformers and even to the early church fathers who interpreted scripture. Well, let's move on to the next section of your book then. You talk about uh, Lambeth, Lambeth, the Resolution 110, and you talk about GAFCON, the Jerusalem Statement. Uh, clearly, at leadership level, at the primatial level, uh, the church understands the role of scripture, the role of marriage, the role of gender, um, the role of the church. However, when you get to the minutia of other leadership, the uh, uh, Lambeth, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, you know, on down, it gets lost. The, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the knowledge of what Scripture says is lost. And I think the GAFCON movement is a largely a response to parts of that. Right. Well, that second section of my book, I would almost call kind of the narrative uh, from 1998 to 2008, because I think there were two significant meetings uh, at each end of that uh, time. The first was the Lambeth Conference in 1998, and the second, the GAFCON conference in Jerusalem in 2008. And I happen to be present at both of those. And so I've argued that in a real sense, if I can be provocative, the Lambeth conference in 1998 was the last Lambeth conference of authority. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the aura has shifted now to GAFCON. And so in the book, I not only describe the events between that time and why, it, why GAFCON was even held. Secondly, I, I uh, explain those two key documents, because in fact it was Lambeth 1998 that said homosexual practice is incompatible with scripture and cannot be advised. And then on the other hand, we have in the uh, Jerusalem statement and declaration a statement of the authority of the Bible and the need for the church to follow God's word. So between those two milestones, as it were, I think there is a change, or a sea change, I call it, in Anglican history. There is a change. I mean, exactly what you know, those two conferences uh, uh, held were uh, the primates got together, they agreed on Lambeth 110. Yeah, that, that looks pretty good. I mean, we can agree to that. By the time it got to the final day, somebody lost it. The minutia yep. of Anglican leadership said, we can't really have this, you know, in our wake and representing us as, as Lambeth attendees um, well, perfectly. I think, you'll, I think you'll see in one of my later essays, just in the last year or two, I've fisked statements by the current Archbishop of Canterbury, which makes it quite clear that he does not accept the authority of Lambeth 110. In fact, he's busy erasing it so that he can reintroduce what I call a three-way typology of marriage, abstinence, and faithful partnerships. There has been clearly a difference between Rowan Williams and Justin Welby. Um, You've certainly uh, witnessed this as well. Rowan meant well, um, but uh, Justin has a, a, a different agenda. Well, I think one was more of an intellectual and was more, the other was more of a manager. And yep. right now, I think uh, Archbishop Welby is managing uh, Lambeth 2020. And uh, 
In order to do that, he also needs to diminish GAFCON 2018. Yeah, it does. All right, so on to the future. The last section of your book talks about the future. Right. I look at several different elements as we look forward to the future of what I call the Global Anglican Communion. One is a matter of governance. How do we make decisions? And I, I commend the doctrine of a, of a conciliar uh, uh, mode of decision-making, uh, with particular the, the bishops exercising authority in matters of doctrine. Uh, I, I look also at the two, uh, I would say, family of Anglican, global Anglicans, the GAFCON movement and the global Anglican, uh, uh, global South Anglican network, uh, which have been running along parallel paths, and I've tried to propose a kind of coming together under a joint covenant. That hasn't happened yet, but there is a lot going on in that area. And then finally, I look at a little bit at uh, the, the future of the communion itself. Well, covenant's hard. Uh, that was proposed under Roland Williams. You know, we can get everybody together if we can just agree on, you know, a couple paragraphs that make us, you know, a communion. And I can see the difficulty with GAFCON and the Global South at a covenant level, but these guys are all going in the exact same direction. Yeah. In the end, they have the same ideology. They have the same uh, love for the church and the same desire uh, to disciple the world. And, um, you know, I would hope at some point in the future that they, they can uh, combine their teams. Well, I think they will. I mean, for instance, when I was at the GAFCON primates meeting last week, I mean, almost all of the GAFCON primates are part of the Global South Coalition. Mm -hmm. Most of the Global South Coalition are part of GAFCON. So sometimes these things have to kind of come together um, kind of in a natural way, and then later perhaps you, you put the nice dressing on it in terms of a covenant or some sort of formal uh, agreement. All right, so you were involved in GAFCON 1 and GAFCON uh, 2. Um, well, for, before I move on to my agenda, uh, let's talk about where, where can people purchase your book? Yes. Um, number one, you can uh, find it at Anglican Liturgy Press, uh, dot com. I think it is. I'll, Ang put, anyway, I'll, put, I'll put the address here at the bottom so people can see yeah. it. Which is a, a, a branch of Anglican House, which is our publisher. Mm -hmm. The book will also be available on... Uh, Amazon and in a Kindle form within a month or so. But if you want the book today, mm -hmm. there's actually a very good introductory price, twelve ninety five, including shipping, which you can get from Anglican Liturgy Press. So uh, don't wait for Amazon. Okay, no, I won't. Well. <laughs> All right, I, I know George got a copy, and uh, I, I'm getting a copy soon. So uh, I can't. I look forward to it. You're a very good writer, um, and you speak at the lay level which is very important for people like me. And uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, you were involved in GAFCON 1, GAFCON 2. You had a, a large uh, role in uh, forming the uh, Jerusalem Declaration. Um, one of the problems I've seen at the GAFCON movement is it's just amongst primates, not uh, amongst provinces. Right. And uh, so one less conservative primate becomes a leader of a province and boom he's not really all that for uh the gafcon movement because well tech has more money and more influence or vice versa he gets uh voted out and the next guy's all gafcon all the time uh is there a desire in the future to make gafcon more uh by, by into provincial uh declarations yes um Actually, since we last talked five years ago, uh, Kevin, there's been quite a lot of development within GAFCON. Some of it's below the surface, you don't see it, but they've developed a bare bones, but nevertheless effective secretariat, administrative structure. For instance, organizing this conference for almost 2,000 in June, it's a huge operation. But beyond that, uh, GAFCON has been developing a, a subsidiary level of governance. I've actually traveled in February through uh, March to all the regions, South America, uh, Australia, Africa, UK, and, and back here, for meetings of what we're calling 
the Council of Assistors, mm -hmm. or Panel of Assistance. That's a name that's kind of morphing from one into the other, but it'll be called the Council of Assistors. And uh, I know this is probably some people will be in shock about this, but you could almost call it the GAFCON Consultative Council. Oh, wow, oh, chest pain. <laughs> That is, it, it, it represents another layer of uh, governance and, and council, mm -hmm. which will include a bishop, a clergy representative, and a lay representative from each of the uh, provinces or branches. Now, that's another development that you're reading a little bit about now, GAFCON branches. There are now branches, which are not, strictly speaking, provinces under a primate in places like Ireland that just started up. There are places in uh, New Zealand, uh, even Australia, big as it is, is actually a branch, not a province, because the primate is not there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in South America, uh, there are also branches. One of them in Brazil is about ready to grow into being a province. You probably have read that in early May, uh, Miguel Uchoa will actually be made primate of Brazil, a province which is not recognized by Canterbury, but is recognized by GAFCON. That's amazing. A number of developments that have happened in the last five years that I think suggest that the movement actually is is maturing. Good. That's good to hear. Yeah, because one of the worries we had was the, the high turnover rate of the primates. The second biggest worry, and this just happened this year, was we heard um, in early January that there was a secret... Um, consecration of a, a woman bishop and that kind of freaked everybody out because it was obviously thought or implied that we were there's a moratorium not written anywhere but that wasn't going to happen and there was a lot of concern amongst some of the uh, um, dioceses here in the ACNA and clearly uh, some uh, uh, of our English friends and folk and others around the world that boy if you don't have a handle on this you don't have a handle on anything um, I learned now from Intembi that there's been a decision to have a moratorium, but what does that really mean? Okay. Well, actually, I have been involved with this, and it is an interesting example of how GAFCON, I think, is working the way it should. Okay. Uh, three years ago, uh, there were actually two uh, task forces formed from the GAFCON primates meeting. One was a task force on structure, which resulted in these panels of assistance uh, which I just described. The second one was a task force on women in the episcopate. Now it was actually Michael Mazzarelli who had chaired the English uh, task force on women bishops who proposed that we limit our focus to women in the episcopacy rather than women's ordination more generally as mm -hmm. the ACA did. So our task force uh, uh, met for three years. Uh, I was chaired by Bishop Sampson Waluda of Kenya and I was the convener and uh, we had representatives from all the different provinces. We had men, women, ordained uh, presbyter women, uh, bishops' wives, uh, women deacons, uh, and, and bishops and leaders of different sorts. And frankly, we didn't all have the same view of this issue. But we met and listened to each other. We read papers on biblical uh, texts. We looked at the attitudes. We had a questionnaire of the different provinces. And we looked at how women function in different kinds of ministry in these different places. You'd be amazed at the different kinds of women's ministry that go on throughout the, the global uh, communion. Out of that, we then produced a, a set of recommendations uh, to the primates, which they received last year at their primates meeting. It was at that point that the news came out about the consecration of a woman assistant bishop in South Sudan. That caused a problem. Um, but it was one that GAFCON approached by asking these new panels of assistance to give their input. So everywhere that I went this past two months, we discussed that matter. And all of them unanimously uh, agreed with the basic recommendation of the task force, which was that the historic practice of ordaining men only to the Episcopate be retained until or unless a consensus had been reached after further consultation, prayer, and study of Scripture. So that is what 
our different groups brought to the primates last week, and that's what they approved. It's significant, I think, that the, the Archbishop of Sudan, the new Archbishop, Justin Body, was present at that meeting and agreed to that uh, resolution. Now, is this just a way of biding time, or uh, do you think, uh, I mean, one of the biggest problems we've discussed many times with GAFCON is to get this enormous amount of uh, people together, uh, disaffected by tech, disaffected by the Anglican Communion, was to grab all three streams and herd them like cats. And one of the difficulties is not everyone agrees on all points of the hermeneutics, all points of uh, w the women's role in, in ministry, all points of uh, the role of the Holy Spirit, all these types of things. Uh, do you think this, these minutiae can be worked out over time? Yes, because I believe the Holy Spirit doesn't speak in five different voices, mm -hmm. uh, and, and particularly on matters of importance. If we study the scripture to get together prayerfully and carefully, we will eventually come to a sense of God's will for the church. However, we're not there yet. We're yeah. not there in CNA. We're not there in gap time. I do think one of the things that our task force um, uh, solved was that to go to from the level of the priesthood or presbyterate to the level of bishop or episcopate is a major step and that a communion that has women bishops will have much more uh, difficulties staying together than one that has this sort of uh, mixed polity that we have in the ACNA uh, and uh, the fact is you know there are many women priests in Uganda in East Africa particularly but in other uh, churches of the GAFCON community, and frankly, they haven't seen the issue the way some people in uh, our church, for instance, have seen it. Well, so, we need to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, there are provinces in Uganda, or not Uganda, in Africa, that would indeed uh, consecrate female bishops, and they would have no problem with it, and um, those ministries would be welcome within those provinces. Right. And what was exciting, I think, was to find that when representatives of those provinces and the bishops got together and saw the kinds of difficulties that were raised, they said, okay, we'll agree to wait. We'll wait for a consensus to emerge. Okay, we mentioned uh, earlier in the interview and in previous interviews uh, the desire to be conciliar, uh, mm -hmm. to when we make decisions as a church, we do it all in one body. Um, is there uh, desires or programs within GAFCON that that will be the future of our decision making? I think it's already there in principle mm -hmm. with the, the, the Primates Council, and now we're adding a kind of a second level of uh, council, uh, which includes a wider uh, body. And then, of course, obviously, there are the, the individual churches and their, their synods and you know, uh, Phil Ashey in his book on conciliarism has shown how every Anglican uh, structure has had this built into it. Not always practiced well, but it's there. Okay. So yes, um, uh, I guess the real question facing the GAFCON movement is how does this interface with the so-called official Anglican communion with its instruments? And that in some ways is I think the big challenge facing us as we look forward. I called the book global Anglican communion, which I intended to be rather provocative, because it may not be the same as the Canterbury Anglican communion. No. But I do think that is an aspirational title, not a reality. But it's something that's actually happening. Well, it is. And, you know, as a journalist and somebody who's just watched this, you know, progress over the last 10 years, I say within a generation, GAFCON will be the predominant and hopefully official uh, Anglican Communion. I hope so too, because I actually think the alternative is just um, going in the way of the judges, where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It isn't like you're going to restore the colonial communion of the 19th century, uh, with the Archbishop of Canterbury ruling over all the, the you know, the, the colonies. Uh, if if it breaks apart, it's going to break apart into little fragments. Thankfully the Anglican Communion official is not getting a lot of good press, and we hope that GAFCON does 
Uh, it's going to be a big event coming up in Jerusalem, uh, June. Uh, I'll be there June 15th to the 23rd. Um, okay. You will be there with uh, your family as well? Uh, I will be there myself because I've got work to do there. Yes, you do. Every time I talk to you, I'm going to a meeting, I'm going to a meeting, I can't talk. And then we meet at the bar afterwards, and you're usually good for a really good interview, and I hope to, to see you uh, for an interview post GAFCON 3. Uh, Dr. Reverend Steve, oh, I'm sorry, Reverend Stephen, uh, no, I want to thank you for your time, and uh, look forward to our next interview. Okay, Kevin, next June in Jerusalem. June in Jerusalem. <laughs>